Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a lecture on crisis response and ethics. I'm thrilled you could all join us. My name is Gregory Feldman, Columbia Engineering Class of 2012, and it is my pleasure to introduce L.U. Fred Garcia, Adjunct Associate Professor of Professional Development and Leadership. Professor Garcia is a coach, counselor, teacher, writer, and speaker whose clients include some of the largest and best known companies and organizations in the world. Currently, he is president of the crisis management firm Logos Consulting Group and executive director of the Logos Institute for Crisis Management and Executive Leadership. Fred Garcia has over 40 years of experience counseling securities firms, banks, insurance companies, specialized financial and professional services firms, corporations, not-for-profits, and governments. He teaches at NYU and is in his fifth year of teaching at Columbia University. He is also a senior fellow in the Institute of Corporate Communication at Communication University of China in Beijing. Professor Garcia is a frequent guest lecturer at the Wharton School of Business of the University of Pennsylvania, the U.S. Defense Information School, the U.S. Marine Corps Command and Staff College, the U.S. Marine Corps Officer Candidate School, the U.S. Air Force Air War College, the Brookings Institution, and other universities around the world. Garcia has written five books on leadership, trust, and crisis, and is in the middle of writing his next book on the U.S. response to COVID. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Garcia. Thank you, Gregory. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you, everybody. Those who are here in the room and those who are participating remotely, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, throughout our time together, feel free to raise your hand, ask a question, make a comment, challenge me, disagree with me. Uh, I, I'm hoping that this can be as lively as possible. I warn you in advance that I have a point of view about the things I'm going to share with you. <laughs> but it's okay for you to have a different point of view. Uh, but my point of view is backed by evidence, and I'm certain that your point of view will also be backed by evidence. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, as Gregory kindly noted, uh, in addition to the work I'm privileged to do in academic classrooms, uh, I also have a day job, and that day job is running the Logos Institute for Crisis Management and Executive Leadership. And our mission at the Logos Institute is to make the world a better place by equipping people to be leaders who can ignite and inspire others to change the world for the better. And we take that mission very seriously in all of the work that we do. And as Gregory also mentioned, I have the privilege of being on the New York University faculty for the last 34 years. I'm entering my 35th year on the NYU faculty where I teach crisis management in the executive MBA and in the master's in risk management and crisis communication in the master's in public relations and corporate communication. And that's where I thought I would live my academic career until the professional development and leadership department here at Columbia Engineering asked me to consider coming back to Columbia where I did my graduate work 43 years ago and change uh, and consider teaching in this program. And I was initially reluctant to do that until I discovered the mission of Columbia Engineering. And that is to prepare engineers who operate in service to humanity. And that mission aligns very well with my mission. And after a little bit of discernment with my colleagues at the firm, we concluded this would be a good thing to try to do. And I'm delighted to be starting my sixth year in professional development and leadership here at Columbia Engineering. And it has been very, very gratifying for me. At Columbia Engineering, I teach the basic introduction to ethics and integrity for engineers that every single MS and PhD student is required to take. So I'm essentially the vaccination they have to have as a condition of being in the program. Uh, but I also teach electives on advanced ethical decision making, on crisis prevention for engineers, on crisis response for engineers, and also on leadership communication for engineers. And 
it's been a lot of fun to work with engineers in those capacities as well. And in every one of my sessions with the engineers, I tell them this, that I have every confidence in them that they have the capacity to deploy their gifts in ways that can cause great good in the world. Similarly, I have every confidence that they have the capacity to deploy their gifts in ways that can do great harm in the world. And I invite them at the very beginning of their graduate school career to be intentional in their journey of leadership to recognize when they are likely to do great harm. And ideally, they see that great harm through the windshield before they've committed it, and not through the rearview mirror after they have already committed the harm. But that's the opening admonition in every one of the courses I teach to the engineering students here at Columbia Engineering. In the work that I do with the Logos Institute, we focus on issues of ethics, but because we're a crisis management firm, usually when there has been a breakdown in ethical behavior or ethical discernment. We also focus on crises, the prevention of crises, the preparation for crises, the response for crisis, to crises, and the recovery from crises. And although ethics and crisis have an overlap, they're not identical, but what they both have in common is that trust is at risk in both instances. And in my own scholarship, I study the drivers of trust. I study the patterns of trust. I study how easy it is to lose trust and how difficult it is to restore trust once it has been lost and how there's a premium in maintaining trust before you've lost it because it's much harder to recover than it is to lose it in the first place. And I teach those topics in all of the classes that I teach. And one of the disciplines I learned when I was a philosophy student, I was not an engineering student, I was down the brick path in the philosophy building 43, 42, 41 years ago. Uh, in my philosophy studies, I studied among others the philosopher Plato who taught us a method for figuring stuff out. And he said, if you have to learn something that's really difficult, find the big biggest example of it that you can. Because when the example is really big, you can see the patterns really clearly. And those patterns apply also in the very small things. But if you can see them in the really big things, you can see them even better. And then, this is Plato's language, those patterns are laid up in heaven for all to see when they wish to contemplate those patterns. So I teach those patterns to my graduate students. I teach those patterns to my clients. And I use the biggest case studies I can find in order to illustrate those points. And today I'm going to use the biggest case study I've ever had access to. And that case study is COVID-19. And there are huge issues of ethics in the discussion of COVID-19. There are huge issues of crises in our discussion of COVID-19. And we can see the patterns when we look at COVID-19. And unlike just about every other crisis, this is a crisis that simultaneously affects every institution and every human being on planet Earth. So it's about as big as it can get and it affects them simultaneously. So we actually have, metaphorically, a laboratory experiment of how to deal with adversity, how to deal with crisis, how to deal with ethical decision-making, how to deal with the mechanics of getting through the crisis well by comparing different jurisdictions whether they're political jurisdictions or business jurisdictions, we can see how different entities approach the common crisis differently and learn from the patterns. And this is the subject of the book that I'm currently about 175 pages into, 
Uh, I had to take a break for the last six weeks because it was just too depressing to be marinating in that carnage. So I had to step away from writing the book. And I'm going to pick it up this weekend. I think because in preparation for today, I got myself back in the mindset of dealing with the carnage. But I'm going to start before I show you anything with how I'm going to close. And that is about two weeks ago, the head of the US Food and Drug Administration said this. We're going to watch him on tape later on. The single leading cause of death in the United States today is misinformation. The single leading cause of death in the United States today is misinformation. And of the 1,005,000 Americans who are confirmed to have died of COVID, all the public health experts say about 900,000 of them could have been prevented. If only as a nation we'd made better choices faster, executed on those better choices faster, and not been subject to the political polarization and the misinformation in that mix that caused people to behave in ways that not only put themselves at risk, but put many, many others at risk as well. When I teach crisis management here at Columbia and everywhere else I am privileged to teach it, I teach a number of foundational principles. The first of which is, no matter what the crisis is and no matter what the form of organization is, in any crisis, every stakeholder expects the organization and its leaders to care. To care that something happened that should not have happened to care that human beings are at risk, either material risk or financial risk or emotional risk or physical risk or in the case of COVID, risk to life and health and safety. But to care that people are at risk and to do what is necessary to protect people from those risks coming true. That the first obligation of a leader in crisis is to care to care about the people affected, to care about the second order and third order consequences of the decisions they make. Another foundational principle is to take risks seriously. And there's a principle in crisis response and it's known as the golden hour. And the golden hour, which we also have in emergency medicine, says that the longer it takes to do what is necessary, the harder it is because the more we're trying to fix something that has gotten worse rather than prevent that bad thing from happening in the first place. So there's a premium on timeliness in a crisis. But to get through a crisis, well, we need to know how to ask the right questions in the right order. One of the things I learned in philosophy school down the road is you got to ask the right questions in the right order and once you do, a solution reveals itself. So if we take risk seriously, we begin by asking what is the precise nature of the crisis? What is the actual event that happened or that is at risk of happening? So I'll give you some examples. You're all familiar with what happened at Volkswagen about seven years ago. And when Volkswagen was caught cheating, its customers and regulators and others, Volkswagen named the crisis the irregularities in our diesel engines. Yes, you can chuckle at that. There's no one who heard what happened at Volkswagen and said, you know, the diesel engines had irregularities. No, leadership cheated. When a passenger was horribly injured being removed from a United Airlines flight five years ago. The CEO of United Airlines tweeted out an apology for having to reaccommodate our passengers. You remember the video. There's not a single person who saw that video and said, you know, their problem is they had to reaccommodate passengers. So we need to actually name the problem without euphemism. 
We need to name the problem clearly or else we have no, ch no chance of solving the problem as it actually exists. We then identify what are the risks. What are the risks to people? What are the risks to society? What are the risks to finance? What are the risks to our supply chain? What are the risks? And whatever those risks may be, we need to name them clearly because our goal has to always be how do we mitigate those risks? Not how do we try to make ourselves feel better about those risks, which we're going to see is one of the things we find in COVID response, but how do we actually mitigate those risks? And then we ask, what are the options to consider? And for each option, we can foresee a set of predictable outcomes. Option A, what are the predictable consequences if we do A? Option B, what are the predictable consequences if we do B? Option C, what are the predictable consequences if we do C? And then we always choose, and here's the leadership discipline, never based on personal preference. So I never ask a client, which of these would you like to do? but rather based on the less bad option. Yeah, these are all are really bad. Which is the less bad option? So I ask you to think back some years ago when a US Airways plane took off from LaGuardia Airport, flew through a flock of geese, and suddenly became a glider. A 72-ton glider with 155 people on board at 5,000 feet of altitude. I'm sorry, 2,000 feet of altitude. And it was just a matter of minutes before it made contact with the Earth. And the pilot had a choice to make. He could try to turn around and get back to LaGuardia, but if he didn't get back, he would come down with a plane full of explosive jet fuel, a whole bunch of people on board, but a whole lot more people on the ground, all of whom were at risk of being killed or horribly injured. He could try to get to Teterboro Airport across the George Washington Bridge, but if he didn't make it, he'd come down in a heavily populated residential area, and the risk of catastrophic loss of life was huge. No pilot wants to land in the Hudson River, ever. <laughs> but that turned out to be the last bad choice. And it turned out to be the right choice. And not a single person was killed. That's because the best choice is the less bad choice, but you don't choose based on personal preference. You choose based on the foreseeable consequence and what is the less bad of those consequences. And then you ask, how do we execute? That's the framework I teach all of my clients. That's the framework I teach all of my graduate students wherever I'm privileged to teach. Now let's look at COVID. And let's contrast the response to COVID in the Republic of Korea, what outside of Korea they call South Korea, and the United States of America. But to get to the Korean response to COVID, we have to go back a few years before COVID. And that is the year 2015, when South Korea was beset by a public health emergency, a coronavirus that came to be known as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And it became a public health emergency in Korea that caused huge criticism of the government, nearly brought down the government, and it caused a lot of trauma. So here, for example, is the Washington Post at the time saying South Korea on Monday recorded its worst day for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome since the outbreak three weeks ago. The president tried to allay panic to convince a skeptical public that it was on top of the situation. The spiraling health crisis and widespread perception that the administration has been slow and blundering in its response, in other words, that it didn't care, has led to calls for the president to delay her trip to the United States, etc. The government was already struggling with a public trust crisis in the aftermath of a ferry disaster where several hundred people, including high school students, were killed when the equivalent of the Korean Coast Guard could not mount an appropriate rescue operation, and a whole bunch of people died. The lack of transparency had led fearful Koreans to remain behind locked doors, even though authorities said the virus is difficult to catch through casual contact. The outsized reaction to the outbreak is largely linked to the government's handling of it. In other words, trust in the government had collapsed, and that caused the Korean government a lot of distress. 
And what was the magnitude of the crisis that caused this crisis of confidence in the government? It was 185 cases of the disease and 38 deaths. And I want you to think about how quaint times those must have been when 38 fatalities was enough to cause the government to do a fundamental re-examination of how it does its work. We are now in this country at more than a million fatalities. The Korean government took this really seriously. And they decided to find a way to get everyone in the Korean government, in the Korean business community, in the Korean health community on the same page to do it better the next time. So they convened a conference that was jointly sponsored by the Korean Ministry of Public Safety and Security, by the Korean Federation of Industries, and by the leading newspaper group in Korea, Chosun Ilbo. And they brought experts from around the world to teach those officials how to do crisis response better. I know because I was one of the four that they brought in. We brought in a guy from Geneva who was an expert on civil institutions and how they coordinate with each other and with government in an emergency. That's a really important skill. They brought in a guy who's an expert on airplane crashes and mass casualty events and how you deal with mass fatalities. We brought in a social media communication expert from Montreal and I was brought in to essentially teach a version of the class I teach here at Columbia and in other places. And they asked me to cover certain things beyond basic crisis management. They asked me first to do a case study on how the United States had beaten Ebola and the role of the Centers for Disease Control in American public health and how they responded to Ebola, how they coordinated with other governments and with businesses to prevent Ebola from spreading in the United States. They saw the Ebola response as a model to follow. So deconstruct the Ebola response, deconstruct what the Centers for Disease Control do. They also asked me to talk about the failed US government response to the flooding of New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, which I had previously published about, as the closest thing to the ferry disaster. And in particular, how the Federal Emergency Management Agency failed spectacularly to save lives in New Orleans and became completely discredited and people had lost trust in FEMA and how FEMA over time rebuilt that trust so it again became a trusted institution. They wanted to know how do we rebuild trust in our own institutions. And then I went away and it's not because I was their teacher but because they were really good students not only of mine but of everybody else who did that and others who also interacted with them. COVID was first diagnosed in Korea on the very same day that it was first diagnosed in the United States. And we can actually track a timeline of how Korea dealt with COVID-19 and how the United States dealt with COVID-19. And we're going to look at a brief summary of each. The first thing to note is that the Republic of Korea took the risks very, very seriously. And in particular, they launched the whole of government response. More about that in a moment. They followed all of the guidelines of their Centers for Disease Control, which were essentially copied and pasted from the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So they did what the public health experts say you need to do in that kind of crisis. That included mandatory masking. It included quarantine. It included social distancing. It included contact tracing. It included testing. It took a couple of weeks to ramp up the logistics. But if you look at the fatality rate in Korea, you see it plummet as soon as these steps were in place and stay low for the remainder of the year. To the point that the American Journal of Medicine at the end of 2020 did an analysis of the Korean response. And they said Korea coordinated public health strategies, employ, I'm sorry, nationally coordinated public health strategies employed by South Korea effectively contained and mitigated their 
epidemic. I want you to notice the language there. Mitigated their epidemic. It had not become a pandemic in Korea. It had become a pandemic in the United States and other countries around the world, but it remained at epidemic levels in Korea. In contrast, the US government mounted a delayed and fragmented response, becoming and remaining the worldwide epicenter of the pandemic. So they note that distinction. Upon report of the country's first case, South Korea promptly and efficiently instituted nationally coordinated strategies of containment and mitigation. Ironically, these methods, whoops, ironically, these methods were developed and introduced by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So they used our stuff, and it worked. They used our stuff, and it worked. The Washington Post in December noted the difference between how the pandemic has affected the US and South Korea and that it remains staggering. And this is December 4th of 2020. They say from Tuesday to Thursday, the United States recorded more than 8,000 deaths from COVID-19. It was the deadliest three-day period on record, surpassing even back when New York was the epicenter in the spring of that year. He says, now more than nine months after the virus was first detected in the country, this three-day span was 5% higher than that. The toll on Thursday was 2,753. That's a 9-11 number. That's a Hurricane Katrina number that was one day just in December of 2020. In South Korea, the virus was detected on the same day. The COVID death toll is 536. Not on that day, but total since January. More people have died in the United States over five hours on December 3rd than have died of the disease in South Korea overall. The Republic of Korea took risks seriously. They had a whole of government response. They followed all public health guidelines that included mandatory masking, quarantines, distancing, tracing, and testing. So what were the fatalities? In the first calendar year, in the first calendar year, Korea suffered one fatality for every 39,346 South Koreans. One out of every 39,346. I'll come back to that number in a moment. But that's the Korean response. I'm going to pause. Comments, questions, objections, concerns. We both had the playbook and they used it. We both had the playbook and they used it. And sir, there's another playbook. And that is, how do you communicate with the public in a pandemic? And we had that playbook, too. And we're going to see that we didn't use it. But good luck communicating with this public in this country right now. <laughs> good luck communicating with this public in this country, and I agree with that. But I'd like you to do a thought experiment. Think not about today. Think about February of 2020 before the modeling of unsafe public behavior. That's when there was an opportunity for leaders to follow the playbook. And I'd like you to imagine if the people in charge had followed the CDC playbook, and then we're going to see followed a different CDC playbook, and that's the communication playbook. There's a bunch of alphabet soup of public health agencies, yeah. Yeah, yeah but that... That's how governments work. But they were aligned in terms of principles. They weren't necessarily aligned in the government's execution of them. And there's a difference there. Other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. How do you think the different cultures played into uh, the response to the pandemic? Because the acceptance of, you know, So for the, for the benefit of those who are on, on the streaming, the question was how did different cultures affect the, re, the response in total. There's certainly the sense, first, that Korea has a smaller population than the United States, 52 million people, uh, but I'm doing per capita here. But also that there's a greater sense of compliance in the Korean culture, uh, and that's a reality to take into account, but we're going to see 
that in the following year, that compliance culture began to deteriorate, and then the fatalities began to go up again. And, and I'm going to turn to the, the next year next, but, but we're pausing here at the end of year one. But yeah, there is, we can't take, for, we can't ignore the fact that there's a different compliance culture in other parts of the world than there is in the United States. But here, as the gentleman pointed out, there's also a culture of transgressiveness, that there's a part of the culture that says we revel in transgression. And, and that's a big part of what we've been living through for the last five years in particular, but more than five years in general. That's just part of American culture, for better or worse. Yes, sir. The who is the World Health Organization? Yeah, not the band. I love the band, right? Yeah. No, but sometimes the who is brought up as possibly one of the reasons maybe the U.S. delayed versus South Korea. South Korea is more skeptical of their guidance and actually kind of cooperating with the U.S. Well, I actually quote the World Health Organization positively, and have and the United States quoting the health, World Health Organization positively in January of 2020. But by the time this reached senior executive leadership and not the career leadership in the United States, uh, not only was the World Health Organization criticized and chastised, but the president affirmatively pulled the United States out of the World Health Organization because they were saying things contrary to what the leader of the United States government wanted to be, get away with saying. So they were saying, wear masks. And he was saying, you don't have to wear masks. They were saying social distance. Quarantine, he didn't want to go into lockdown. So eventually, by the middle of February, the United States said, don't pay any attention to the World Health Organization, and then affirmatively pulled out of the World Health Organization. Yes? What is the challenge of the And, and the, 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 the question is about scarcity of resources. There were 3 million masks in the national strategic stockpile at the end of January. The career civil servant, PhD in public health, saw that and said, that's enough maybe for every hospital for a week. And we need to ramp up N95 production. He got a call from the only remaining N95 mask producer in the United States that said, hey, we got two assembly lines we could deploy right now, but we're getting calls from a whole bunch of countries and pretty soon we'll have no capacity. That guy, his name's Dr. Rick Bright, went to his boss, who's the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, and he said, no, we don't need the masks. This will go away. He's a political appointee. Dr. Bright then went to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, and said, we need masks. We need a lot of them. And Secretary Azar said, we don't have the budget. And Secretary Azar takes a victory lap around now saying, we did it. We he was my client for 12 years. I'm deeply disappointed in Secretary Azar. And I'm happy to tell them to his face next time I see him. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. U.S. has a federal system, which has many blessings and many challenges. Just looking at last night's news, you see some of the challenges and blessings of the federal system. Uh, the United States had wargamed a public health emergency with coordination of the states, the federal government, civic institutions, public health institutions, and knew how to do it. But by middle of March, the president began to say, no, we're going to leave it to the states. We're not going to do it ourselves. And then the states started complaining they were competing with each other to purchase masks. They were competing with each other to purchase ventilators. They were competing with each other to purchase other personal protective equipment. So the coordinating function that the federal government is supposed to use was not only didn't they use, but it was effectively hobbled by the federal government. So sorry. OK. So, so let's move on. I don't mean to suggest that everything that happened in Korea was sunshine and light, because in the second year, conditions began to deteriorate. Social conditions began to deteriorate. In particular, there was slow uptake in vaccinations when the vaccinations became universally available. 
By late summer, the government was under a lot of pressure. Hey, we've been doing this for 18 months. Ease up. Let us go back to work. Let us leave our homes. And they did relax it. And by October, fatalities had doubled from what they were in January. By December, they had tripled from what they had been in January. So this just shows what happens when we fail to follow public health guidelines. We can see you turn the spigot a bit, and you see a meaningful impact. So in the first year, Korea saw a death rate of one in every 39,346. By the end of the October, when, it, when fatalities had doubled, uh, one in every 19,000. By December, when fatalities had tripled, one in every 11,000. After one year, one in every 8,000. And as of this past Wednesday, one in every 2,000. <laughs> so you see what happens when the public health measures are not followed rigorously. You go from one in every 40,000 to one in every 2,000. And that's a real demonstration of the relationship of public health measures to fatalities. Which brings us to the United States. How are we doing on time? Oh, OK. Which brings us to the United States. In January of 2020, the president's na uh, national security daily intelligence briefing in writing had multiple instances of a risk assessment that COVID-19 was a likely cataclysmic event. And it moved from we're, we're studying what's happening in Wuhan to this has the possibility of being a cataclysmic event. This has a likelihood of being a cataclysmic event. And by the end of January, by January 28th, the president's national security advisor told the president of the United States verbally in the Oval Office that COVID-19 would be the biggest national security threat in his presidency. That's Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor. His deputy is a guy named Matthew Bollinger. And Matt Bollinger is a former Wall Street Journal reporter who had been living in China during the SARS epidemic in 2003. He was fluent in Mandarin. He knew all the health authorities in China. And when the president heard from his national security advisor, this will be the biggest cataclysmic event, he asked, what is happening in China? And Matt Bollinger said, I've been talking to my contacts in China. And I asked them, will this be as bad as SARS? And they're telling me, don't think SARS. Think of 1918-1919 flu, which took out millions of people around the world. So the president knew as of the 28th that this was a big deal. On February 7th, a week later, he tells Woodward, Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, that he knows that COVID is spread in the air and is contracted by breathing. He knows that it is five times more deadly than the flu. And if you know that it is spread in the air, that it is contracted by breathing, and that it is more deadly than the flu, there are measures you can take to prevent breathing the stuff that's in the air. By the 19th of March, he has another conversation with Bob Woodward in which he says, it's not just old people, it's young people too. Woodward asks him, Mr. President, do you believe that this will be the leadership challenge of your lifetime? And the president says, no, I don't. This is going to be fine. He says, you know, a lot of people call me a wartime president. Woodward says, tell me who. <laughs> the president changes the subject. So as of mid-March, the president of the United States admits to Woodward that he knows the following. The virus is airborne, contracted through breathing the virus. It is five times more deadly, in March he said, than even your most strenuous flus. He says, even young people can get it. So how do 
do you mitigate those risks? How do you mitigate those risks? Well, we know. <laughs> we mitigate those risks by taking those risks seriously. Here's another really difficult story. After Ebola, the United States government did not do a victory lap. After Ebola, the United States government did a deep analysis. How do we do this even better the next time? And what they realized was there wasn't a mechanism at the highest levels of policy to coordinate all of the federal agencies, the alphabet soup, all of the state governments, the federalist system, all of the civic institutions. So they created a high level directorate in the National Security Council on the, 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 uh, the agency for biodefense. And it was charged with coordinating all of the instruments of policy in the federal and state governments to prevent an outbreak from becoming an epidemic, to prevent an epidemic from becoming a pandemic. And it did war games to test how to make this happen with all of those civic institutions. In 2018, the Trump administration eliminated that directorate. So there was no senior government coordinating body in charge in the National Security Council when this outbreak happened. And the person who had headed that in the prior administration told CNN, in a health security crisis, speed is essential. The sooner you take mitigation steps, the more meaningfully you can mitigate the outbreak. The specter of rapid community transmission and exponential growth is real and daunting. So you want to be timely. So you discover in January you only have 3 million masks. That's enough for our hospitals for one week. Let's ramp up mask production. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to have this spread all over the place. But they said, no, we don't have the budget. We're not going to do it. If they had taken risks seriously, they would have a whole of government response with the very body that existed to create a whole of government response had been eliminated, and instead we had a fragments of government response. To this day, we still don't have a whole of government response. That where you happen to live determines the public policy with respect to public health. You would follow all US CDC guidelines and the United States never has in the pandemic. You would have mandatory masking, quarantine, social distancing, contact tracing, and testing. We had none of those. Not at the national level in 2020 or even to this day. I mentioned Dr. Rick Bright. He was the career public health civil servants in the Department of Health and Human Services. He tried to get testing, but because the testing was developed by the World Health Organization, he was told, no, we're not going to use their tests. We need to develop our own tests. And the tests that we developed did not work. He tried to get masking. He was told, we don't have a budget. He tried to get, let's shut down, the gover uh, the, shut down uh, businesses and large events. He was told to stay in his lane. By the middle of March, he, as a career civil servant, couldn't be fired. He was removed from his position and given a make work job at a cubicle at the National Institutes of Health. He filed a whistleblower complaint against the government. He testified in front of Congress on May 14th, 2020. And he said, there is no master coordinated plan on how to respond to this outbreak. Not there was no, even by the middle of May 2020, three months into the pandemic, at which point thousands of Americans had already died. There is no plan. There is no master coordinated plan on how to respond to the outbreak. We don't have a strategy or plan in place. We need a comprehensive national strategy that's end to end. It includes every component to make sure that we can respond and protect American lives. He was sounding the alarm in May of 2020. On the day that the president said, you know, some people call me a wartime president, we had 265 confirmed fatalities. That day, he told Woodward that he was intentionally playing the pandemic down. A, a, a moment of talking to somebody, going through this with Fauci or somebody 
who kind of, uh, it caused a pivot in your mind, because it's clear just from what's in on the public record that you went through a pivot on this to, oh my God, the gravity is uh, almost inexplicable and unexplainable. Well, I think, Bob, really, to be honest with you, sure, I, want you to I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down Yes, sir. because I don't want to create a panic. When I heard, that, I didn't hear this till August, but when I heard this in August, I don't want to create a panic, I was confused. He'd spent years creating panic. He'd spent years creating panic, so what could he possibly mean but he didn't want to create a panic? And then I went back and looked at the calendar. On the day he said that, the stock market had plummeted with the worst performance since the crash of 1987. And he was worried about creating a panic on Wall Street because he had tied his hopes for re-election on a strong economy. And he always says, you know, the market's doing really well when asked about the economy. And he conflates the economy and the market. And when I go back and say, what could he possibly have meant? Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he didn't want to create a panic. In what context does that make sense? Well, it makes context in the sense of the stock market. But now we turn to the playbook. Sir, there's a second playbook. Not the how do we stop the contagion as a matter of science, but how do we stop the contagion as a matter of public understanding. And there's a playbook called the Crisis Emergency Risk Communication Manual published by the CDC, and it has been used in every public health emergency in the United States since it was published, including Ebola. And there are a number of key principles, and they include the first, crises are time sensitive. Communicating information quickly is almost always important. For members of the public, the first source of information often becomes the preferred source. And sir, that's why I asked the question, imagine if back in February, the leaders of the national government had said, wear a mask. The first thing they heard was, no, you don't need a mask. The pretext was, we don't have enough supply. But that's a pretext. They made no effort to build up supply at the time they were saying, we don't have enough supply. But imagine if that's the first thing they had heard. Come on in. Imagine if that had been the first thing they'd heard. Second, be right. Accuracy establishes credibility. Information can include what we do know, what we don't know, and what is being done to fill the gap. Tell people what you know, tell people what you don't know. Tell them what you're doing to figure that out. Be credible. Honesty and truthfulness should, I'm going to underscore this, not be compromised in the crisis. This is one of those places where ethics and crisis overlap. Be honest, be truthful, do not compromise honesty. Express empathy, because in a crisis, everyone expects the leader to care. Express empathy. Address what people are feeling, the challenges they face. This builds trust, this builds credibility, it builds rapport. Promote action, give people meaningful things to do. Mask up. Distance. Show respect. Respectful communication is particularly important when people feel vulnerable. Respectful communication promotes cooperation and rapport. This is in the playbook. Here are some tactical admonitions. Get the facts right. Repeat the facts often using non-technical terms. Avoid providing sketchy details in the early part of the response. Ensure that all credible sources share the same facts. Speak in one voice. Inconsistent messages will increase anxiety, quickly undermine expert advice and credibility. Pay no attention to Fauci. <laughs> Avoid condescending or judgmental phrases. Yeah. Avoid promising or guaranteeing things unless you know you can deliver. Don't promise or guarantee things you can't deliver. And avoid speculation and assumptions. This is in the playbook. The Washington Post pointed out 
Trump is breaking every rule in the playbook. The fundamental principles behind pub good public health communication are almost stunningly simple. Be consistent, be accurate, don't withhold vital information, the CDC manual said, and above all, don't let anyone onto the podium without preparation, knowledge, and discipline to de deliver vital health messages. Nearly every day since the coronavirus landed in America, the White House has issued mixed and conflicting messages <coughs> from multiple sources, the first guideline in the, in the manual's list of potentially harmful practices. Overly reassuring and unrealistic communication, which is what is to be avoided, has come from the highest levels of the government. And by highest levels, they mean the highest level. Sir. Yeah, um, pretty tough question, actually. Yeah. Doesn't apply to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when it's crisis. Yeah. Given how common it is, I wonder, are there scenarios or circumstances when it's just the right thing to do? So the question is, are there circumstances where withholding information is the right thing to do? Let me share this. I do a lot of work with the United States military. Yesterday and the four days before, I was part of the National Security Seminar at the Army War College. There are circumstances where you don't want to disclose certain things yet because you'll tell your adversary, your enemy, and they will come after you. So there are national security reasons to withhold information until you can release them. There are contractual confidentiality issues that you may not be able to disclose, but affirmatively putting out misinformation almost always comes back to bite you. And when the consequences of misinformation are innocent people die, then that's an argument for not putting out that misinformation. So there's a distinction between withholding and affirmatively misleading. Now, sometimes leaders affirmatively mislead because they're dishonest. Sometimes they affirmatively mislead because they're delusional. Sometimes they affirmatively mislead because they're in a panic and they're not thinking clearly. But it could be all three. It, and sometimes it could be all three, but, but and I'm not judging any particular leader except this one. Uh, I'm not judging any particular leader who might be in a panic or who might be delusional or who might even be dishonest except as an ethics professor. I think they shouldn't be. But when you're doing that, when the consequences of the dishonesty are that people die, that's a big deal. And, and I spent a lot of time with my clients saying, as a practical matter, you're going to have to disclose it anyway. But if you're forced to disclose it after the fact, you get none of the credit for it. And in fact, you're going to get criticism for withholding it. So if you, have to release, if you have to disclose it anyway, do it when it can do you some good. That's a practical argument, not a moral argument. And that's one that is usually persuasive. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there is some sort of playbook on how to deal with these type of personalities, whether it be in corporate world, especially if you're indirectly involved in that. Right. Uh, I've written one of them. <laughs> And, and that is to always get the boss to focus on the foreseeable outcomes. Yeah, boss, we can withhold. What's the foreseeable outcome of withholding? We can reveal only what we minimally know we're going to get out anyway. What is the consequence of putting out what we know we're minimally going to be put, have to put out anyway? We can put out everything. What is the foreseeable consequence? And then ask, based on the outcomes, which one better assures our long-term survival or our long-term prosperity? I'm going to have a chapter in this book on how do you deal with this when the consequences are so significant and so dire. Right. So let's move on. It will, so knowing what the playbook says to do and not do, here's a four minute montage not put together by me of the president speaking from January until early June. It's only four minutes long. But I want you to notice in the upper left, there's an indication of how many cases we have in the United States as the president is saying what he's saying. So here's four minutes of the president from January to June. It will go away, just stay calm, it will go away. A lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat, as the heat comes in. Uh, typically, that will go away in April. We're in great shape. 12 cases. Like the flu. 15 people. 60 cases. 15 people. 
they're getting better. Mm -hmm. And soon they're all going to be better. Hopefully it's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle it will disappear. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. And this is their new hoax. So healthy people, if you're healthy, uh, you will probably uh, go through a process and, and you'll be fine. You take a solid flu vaccine, you don't think that would have an impact or much of an impact on Corona? No. no. Probably not. Mr. President, is it safe for a 100 cases. During a public health crisis like this? Uh, I think it's very safe, yeah. I think it's very safe. Things are going very well, as you see. Do you believe it's inevitable that the coronavirus will spread across the country? No, I don't think that's inevitable at all. We have a report today, the global death rate at 3.4%. Well, I think that 3.4% is really a false number. Now, this is just my hunch. Personally, I would say the number is way under 1%. At this moment, we think we have it very much in hand. It's going to all work out. Everybody has to be calm. It's all going to work out. Then, People have to remain calm. Be calm. It's really working out, and a lot of good things are going to happen. 1,300. Seriously enough, and that some of your statements don't match what your health experts are saying. That's CNN. Fake news. This is just a temporary moment of time. We're in great shape compared to other places. Uh, we are in really good shape. And five million within a two thousand cases. We're near that. As of this moment, we have fifty deaths which is uh, a lot of good decisions that were made. That number could be many times that. But it's something that we have uh, tremendous control of. And on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your response to this crisis? I'd rate it at 10. I think we've done a great job. If we're going to defeat the invisible enemy. I think we're going to do it even faster than we thought. And it will be a complete victory. It will be a total victory. People will get better. I mean, most people are getting 13,000 cases. By far, the people, are, you get better. Is it possible that your impulse to put a positive spin on things may be giving Americans a false sense of hope? No, I think so. Many doctors, and I've read many, many 24,000. It's a great job that we've done. Doing it the way we're doing it is much better. 33,000. America will again, and soon. 44,000. Very soon, near the end of our history. 55,000. Invisible enemy. I think it's ridiculous. We don't have to do it. 69,000. The states could go back right now, and they probably will. This is going to go away. One million. It's going to go. It's going to leave. It's going to be gone. It's going to be eradicated. But with or without a vaccine, it's going to pass. This virus is going to disappear. It's a question of what. It's going to go away without a vaccine. We have met the moment. And we have prevailed. Go away at some point, it'll go away. We stop testing right now. Whatever a few cases of any. I would say even without it, it goes away. The numbers are very minuscule compared to where it was. It's dying out. I think that at some point uh, that's going to sort of just disappear. So that's just a sample put together by someone else of the kinds of communication the leader was making. Notice at all times unmasked. Even though he knew that it was transmitted by, through the air, contracted by breathing. But this is into July. It will go. The Washington Post had begun compiling misstatements by the president before the election. But since the election, they kept track on a daily basis. And they reported in July of 2020 that the president had made 20,000 false claims from the time he took office on the 20th of January 2017 until the beginning of July of 2020. By July, he was averaging 23 misstatements per day. By October 2020, it was 50 plus per day. Of course, that was also getting closer and closer to the election. In October of 2020, the Cornell Alliance for Science did a statistical analysis of media coverage of misinformation, I'm sorry, media coverage of the pandemic and identified false statements in that media coverage. What they did was they looked at 38 million English language news stories 
about COVID-19 between January and the end of May, they identified 1.1 million news stories with COVID misinformation, false statements by people in positions of authority about the disease. They concluded that the president was the largest source of misinformation. 37% of the articles with misinformation directly quoted the president. If you look at those who quoted who were quoted quoting the president, if you look at once removed quotes by the president, it goes up to 50% of all of the stories with false COVID quoted the president or quoted somebody quoting the president. And why does that matter? And sir, this gets to the playbook question you asked before, and if only early in the process people had been told the truth, the Cornell Alliance for Science says, these findings are significant because if people are misled by unscientific and unsubstantiated claims about the disease, they may attempt harmful cures or be less likely to observe official guidance and thus risk spreading the virus. Not just risk contracting the virus, but risk spreading it to others. And in August, here are some of the things that people were saying because they believed the misinformation. Why are you not wearing your mask? Because there's no COVID. It's a, it's a fake pandemic created to destroy the United States of America. But the president said to Bob Woodward that there is a virus, the coronavirus, and that it is deadly. That's his opinion. The truth is, is that the, the CDC said that only less than 10,000 people died from COVID. The other 190,000 have 2.6 2 or 2.8 other mortalities. Does it worry you guys all to be in this crowded space? I'm not afraid. The good Lord takes care of me. If I die, I die. We got to get this country moving. Can't, what can you do? Wear masks and stay inside for another year? Huh? Where will that get us? So 200,000 Americans had died at that point. And there were still public rallies without masks, without social distancing. Columbia University's National Center for Disaster Preparedness, which is part of the Columbia University Earth Institute run by Jeffrey Sachs, came out with a report in mid-October, 21st of October. They did a statistical analysis of how the United States responded to COVID and how peer countries responded to COVID. And it projected, what if the United States had done what Germany did? What if the United States had done what Japan did? What Canada did? What Korea did? What would the death rate have been? At the time of this report, there were 217,000 American fatalities. They concluded that depending on which country you compare to, we could have saved as many as 210,000 of the 217,000 fatalities up to that point. The report looks at the staggering and disproportionate neighbor, nature of COVID-19 fatalities in the United States, which now ranks first in the world in total number of fatalities to estimate how many deaths were, quote, avoidable, with 217,000 lives lost and a disproportional mortality rate twice that of neighboring Canada and more than 50 times that of Japan, a country with a much older population than the US, the United States has turned a global crisis into a devastating tragedy. And through a comparative analysis, we estimate that at least 130 and as many as 210 fatalities could have been avoided. Here's the deaths per 100,000 France, Canada, Germany, Australia, Japan, South Korea, as of the 21st of October. They conclude by failing to implement the type of response strategies employed in the six comparison countries, our analysis shows that the United States may have incurred at least 130,000 avoidable deaths. <clears throat> if the US response had mirrored that of Germany, we may have had only 38,000 deaths. And in the unique case of Korea, which had one of the quickest and most robust intervention strategies, the US might have seen just 2,799. 
They then addressed why the fatality rate was so high in the United States. They said it was because of a delayed response, insufficient testing capacity, lack of mask mandate and guidance, and politicization that included a leadership vacuum and failure of top officials to model best practices, including to model best practices early. Yes, sir. And it's also comparisons of different countries when there are so many cultural differences in, in Absolutely. Countries. For example, Sweden did not have masks and their death rate was no higher than, than the U.S.'s. Another thing is that um, one doctor that I know said that the highest death rates or infection rates of COVID are among blacks, Latinos, and Jews. And some of the countries that you mentioned have very few, they're not the type of, you know, the melting pot that the United States is. That, so that's a fair, fair uh, so observation. City, right. We have congestion. You're in population density. You're in an elevator in an office building or in your apartment house with lots of people. We have subways and buses. And people are not going to just change their, all, their tr all their customs and rituals just because of this. I agree with you. So, you know, I think you're making some unfair comparisons. I'm reporting other people's comparisons, but I am selectively reporting other people's comparisons. I take that. But yes, sir. 66-fold difference. Yeah. So if you cut it in half, it's still 33-fold. So regardless of the cultural differences, the population yeah. density differences, it, it's a huge, huge and, difference. And keep in mind here, we're still looking at October. Again, Korea relaxed and saw its fatality rate go. We also saw Sweden reconsider a lot of the ways it did things because the consequences in Sweden after this time period were less favorable. We also saw other countries try different approaches with different consequences. Yes? Yeah, I think South Korea actually population density is much higher. You know, it's uh, <laughs> in a sense that all the apartment buildings in Seoul, so I think, you know, in the U.S. you still have a lot of rural areas, so that's not really, you know what I'm saying, and so I don't think it's really and with respect to New York, New York, because it was the first major urban center in the United States to get it because of the influx of the disease from Europe, and because we really didn't understand the disease when it got to New York, New York had the worst fatality rate for the longest period. It continues to have the highest per capita rate uh, of most of the other regions of the United States. We're going to look at it later on. As of this week, one in every 330 Americans have died of COVID. One out of every 200 New Yorkers has died of COVID. But most of those were in the first months of the pandemic. And that's when we had refrigerator trucks out at, at uh, Elmhurst Hospital and other places. But I also note New Yorkers were far more compliant in staying at home in wearing masks, and even now as I travel on business around the country, and I was in Pennsylvania yesterday, New Yorkers continue to wear masks to a far greater degree than people in other parts of the country. There are some parts of the country where I see no masks at all, and I put on my N95 because I don't want to get it from the people who may be carrying it. Yes, ma'am. And so the question is, how do, you, how do you communicate quickly, even when you don't have all the facts and you're managing change fatigue? The first thing is you communicate honestly, and the playbook says, tell people what you know, tell people what you don't know, tell people what you're doing to fill the gap. But also tell them what we know will change, and as what we know changes, we will make recommendations based on our current state of knowledge. So one of the things I've heard throughout the pandemic is make up your mind. Can we go to school? Can we not go to school? And I equate that to yelling at the weatherman. Make up your mind. You said it stopped raining yesterday. Well, it's raining today. And as circumstances change, we need to update our advice based on the state of the circumstance and our knowledge. When we thought it might be transmitted through surfaces, everyone was sanitizing surfaces. And then we concluded, you know, it really isn't likely to be spread by surfaces, so we stopped sanitizing surfaces. 
But at the beginning, out of an abundance of caution, we really don't know whether it's spread by the surfaces. So let's make sure that the surfaces are pristine. That's just an example of the change in what we know. And let's talk about fatigue. Yeah, change is scary even when it's benign, like we're going to a different office at work. Oh my God, we're going to a different office. People freak out at the slightest thing that is different in their lives. Change fatigue is real, and we have to take it serious. I think that's one of the reasons that the Korean government acquiesced and said, okay, let's reopen, because our people are really tired of being locked indoors. But as with any choice, there are trade-offs. And my point is, you should make those trade-offs with eyes wide open and not with misinformation and dishonesty. That's where ethics and crisis overlap. Yes, sir. I think here you're actually using the number of that as the, uh, the only, maybe, maybe the, the most important measures. Well, that's what they were doing. Measures, right? Yes. For assessing the, uh, whether the crisis management response is appropriate or effective or not. But I think that might not be the only metrics you should use, right? Because if you use this, the number of deaths as the most important metrics, then you can say China did the best job. And China did a fine job, even. You should get Olympic gold medals because there's very few people died from the uh, from the from from how China dealt with the, uh, the COVID-19. But uh, you know, from the hold recent, on one one at a time. You'll speak, yeah, sir. Go ahead. From the recent, <laughs> Very few people, right? But well, relative to population. Yeah, but of course, the number is, is questionable, but, but at least on the population numbers, you mean that people died in China from the COVID is just very, very low, I mean, compared to any countries in the world. So, but uh, I mean, right now, especially recent month, right, from all those like very strict lockdown measures to prevent people from contracting virus and uh, from dying from the virus, you know, people are suffering, right? They're right. dying from other causes. So I, you, you cannot really say China is, is doing a great job right now. Well, the World Health Organization yeah. said China did a great job in the early months. Yeah, in the early months, that's right. probably true. But, right. from, from, but from the recent month, the experience, you know, if you only use the number of deaths as the measure, then you really cannot really say that China is doing a great job. The statisticians look at all number of data, yeah. number of cases, the demographics of the cases, including age and ethnicity, and whether they're in, in, in situations where they're all together, like in a jail or in a senior home or something like that. But also, they look at geographic distribution within a population. They look at all number of things, cases, hospitalizations, number of people in ICU, number of people on ventilators. They look at all of those things. All of those are going to be in my book. But today we have time for one metric yeah, no, no. as a comparator. Yes, sir. Not and and we, 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 I'm, I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go with the published data with an asterisk. One major victory in COVID is the development of the vaccine over the U.S. The U.S. with international partners. Yeah. relationship of vaccination hesitancy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what's interesting is a big part of the population in the United States that is vaccine, not only hesitant, but hostile, is also mask hesitant and hostile. And, and as a matter of logic, if you're going to be opposed to one, you probably ought to be in favor of the other. But it's interesting that it comes in a package in the United States. I'm going to move on just in the interest of time. I take the criticisms as valid. I'm not in any way dismissing them. And I appreciate your making them. Let's continue. The failure of the United States to create a rigorous national strategy for testing and tracing, to coordinate data collection among the states, it goes back to the federalism question that we had before, uh, and uh, to recognize the scientific validity of what they call non-pharmaceutical interventions, that basically means masks uh, and social distancing, 
reflect a deeply inadequate national response uh, when contrasted with other higher income countries, uh, you know the rest. Now the British uh, medical journal Lancet did an analysis uh, and in particular put the responsibility for this right at the top of the American government. That his dismissal of the threat dis despite publicly acknowledging it, his discouraging action as the infection spread, and his refusal to cooperate with international bodies like the World Health Organization, his refusal to develop a national strategy worsens shortages of personal protective equipment by the politicizing of mask wearing and school reopenings and convening indoor events with thousands of people where masks were discouraged. All of that contributed to the poor consequences. So what is the comparator just for the first year? And yes, there are cultural differences, there are demographic differences, there are compliance differences, but as somebody pointed out, yeah, but it's 55 or 60 to one compared to 30 to one. Well, in the first year, one per 39,000 of population. In the first year, one out of every 809 of population, 49 times. The US fatality rate was 49 times that of South Korea and that can't be explained by demographics and culture and population density alone. When you look at you. One of the, the medical experts on the coronavirus task force in the White House was Dr. Elizabeth Burks. Uh, I fail to give her credit because while she was in the White House, she seemed unable to publicly declare what she knew to be true. But after she left the White House, she was interviewed by CNN, and in particular about the fatality rate in the United States. And here, by the way, Dr. Elizabeth Burks was a senior officer in the United States Army Medical Corps, highly respected public health authority, and the physician in the White House on the coronavirus task force in charge of informing the public about public health policy. When you look at your data now and you think, okay, had we mitigated earlier, had we actually paused earlier and actually done it, how much of an impact do you think that would have made? Well, I look at it this way. The first time we have an excuse, there were about 100,000 deaths that came from that original surge. All of the rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased substantially if we took the lessons we had learned from that moment. That's what bothers me every day. And that's why I have to be able to process this and understand this because like you said, in a post-mortem, we have to come out of this and learn how to do it better the next time. So I call your attention back to Dr. Rick Bright, the career civil servant public health official who testified to Congress that what we need is an end-to-end -end strategy. And that end-to-end -end means into every household. We need a strategy into every household on how to deal with this. By December 10th of 2020, remarkably, I give the government credit, remarkably, we had an effective vaccine available. And we all remember the pictures of the FedEx trucks being loaded with the Pfizer vaccine and driving out to deliver the Pfizer vaccine to the different distribution sites in the different states. Despite that, this four-star general was the person in charge of developing the vaccines that quickly. He was the head of Operation Warp Speed, General Perna. Four-star general, one of the best logisticians on the planet. And his job was to deliver the vaccines to FedEx. <laughs> From research lab to we make the vaccines, we deliver the vaccines to the distribution points. There was no last mile strategy. There was no how do we get the vaccines in people's arms. No strategy for how do we turn vaccines into vaccinations. So he said this, this is Dr. Perna. 
What I get frustrated on was, where was the long-term strategy for getting people to start taking the vaccine? The vaccine was going to come. We didn't cut any corners. The vaccine, it's going to save lives. Where was that strategy? That was not part of the Operation Warp Speed portfolio. And he knows this, look, it's a personal choice to get a vaccine or not. But where was the presentation to inform everybody so they could make the best decision for themselves? Where was the responsibility to not let this get politicized? Where was the access to knowledge that everybody could listen to, question, read more about, so when the vaccine came out, it was just, in, uh, it, it was just time to make a choice. You either get it or you don't. You don't have to start your discernment right away. He said there was no strategy. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Generals salute briskly follow orders and say, I'm going to fulfill my mission. His mission was get the vaccine up and running. He assumed somebody else would take from there. That's what logisticians do. They don't say, OK, I'm going to help you fire this weapon. I'm going to deliver the ammunition to the fort. Right, but if it's got to be end to end, that means. And he wasn't part of end to end. He was, he was just one of the, the hubs in that end to end. I see a hand. <laughs> Oasis County. What's an Oasis County? The county that administered the vaccine. That's a county that administered the vaccine. Yeah, but most other counties, I assume, did the same thing. I thought it was in Virginia. Yeah. There, there were a lot of counties that weren't ready. But, but he, he's not criticizing the officials. He's criticizing where's the national strategy? Where's the education campaign on vaccinations? Because the feds were developing the vaccine. Yeah, but they, they, they were able to go to the county. So and where was the county vaccination education strategy? Evidently, have one. They did it very well. Well, they did. They, 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 they delivered the vaccination well in that county. Yeah. But where was the demand for vaccine? He, the, what the general is questioning is where is the public education campaign to get people to understand what the vaccine is, why it's important to take it? There was an assumption that people, would, because people wanted it, they would take it. And there wasn't. And, he, and here's why he says that's an issue. Because of that information vacuum, when the misinformation came out, people who were inclined to believe the misinformation suddenly started to double down on that misinformation. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, a little louder. Here he's not talking about individual data privacy issues. He's talking about where's the public education campaign to get the vaccine? Now, here in New York City, we saw the New York City Health Commissioner on TV saying, hey, the, the vaccination is really important. I took it. My kids are going to take it as soon as it's available. Here's what you need to know about the vaccine. It's safe. It's effective. It was well tested. It's been in more than a billion people around the world. It is not experimental, but that was after the misinformation had already gone out. And again, whoever is the first to communicate typically controls the narrative. And his criticism was, where's the narrative that says a vaccine is a good thing? There was an assumption that the vaccine was a good thing. Well, even now, they're hesitant to give the full facts because I know there have been serious reactions to the vaccine and it's been suppressed by the government. It may be. I've had four. <laughs> four is it all right? Yeah. I didn't have any reaction at all. Well, I did the first one. They right. too loud in my arm, so There never was a federal public education campaign as to why the vaccine matters until after the misinformation came out. We're going to have to move on. Yes, sir, one, one more comment. Then I think you make a very interesting point. I never thought about it before. Um, I guess the one maybe question that is making me think of would it be responsible We knew three weeks before it arrived that it was coming. There was even a countdown. And that's when we could have started talking about, here's why the vaccine matters. I guess, OK, if we think three weeks is enough, I guess I was thinking during the whole. I worry that if you do it and you don't have certainty when it's coming, people will not believe you. But we knew at the end of November that by December 10th, the vaccine would be ready to be distributed. 
we would have sufficient quantities. Right. The Russian Libby or the Chinese vaccine or the something with that effectiveness. Do you think there is maybe some risk mitigation maybe you go in for or maybe the thing you if it didn't work out, would that cause more of a problem? I think the re one reason we didn't get it till December is because they wanted to make sure that the clinical trials were done and there was a lot of pressure on to get it done faster. And both Pfizer and Moderna and the FDA to their credit said no. And they even said let the advisory panels of scientists look at this first and let the advisory panels advise the FDA and the CDC, and it's only after the, the independent advisory panels advised that they said, yeah, we're now going to ramp it up, we're now going to get it ready, and it'll be ready December 10. But let's talk, we're going to talk in a moment about why that misinformation matters so much. Uh, if you look at vaccine hesitancy, you find that it has become politicized, that people who are exposed to online mis misinformation the daily vaccination per one million of population, people who are more likely to be democratic or more likely to be vaccinated and not, uh, those who exhibit vaccine hesitancy are more likely to be on the president's party rather than the other party. Why does this matter? The same Earth Institute that in October of 2020 talked about the preventable deaths updated this a year later. This is from Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, who runs the Earth Institute, in which the National Center for Disaster Preparedness is a part. Back when there were about 700,000 fatalities, he said many public lives would have been saved if the US had only implemented basic public health protections until mass vaccination coverage was possible. Mask mandates, physical distancing, testing, tracing, isolation procedures, and closing large events. Once the vaccine arrived, continue use of Precautionary actions would have helped to keep the virus at bay. If the U.S. had done what is necessary to keep the death rate the same as our peer countries, the U.S. would have saved 650,000 of the 700-something thousand at the time. Now, something really interesting began to happen, and that is vaccines became far more available in January than they were in December. I got mine in January of 2020. Uh, because Columbia professors were eligible as teachers, and teachers were 1B status, so I got mine on January 15th, which was, my wife, who's not a teacher, had to wait until the end of March. But by April, vaccinations were readily available to anyone above uh, 21, 18 years of age in the United States and conveniently accessible in a bunch of places we saw the fatality rate begin to plummet. From January, by April it was going down, and by early June, it was almost, the fatality rate was almost down to zero. And then, the politicization of the vaccine became huge. And that's when people said it's experimental, it's the government's attempt to track you, they put a tracking device, if you get a key and you put it on your neck, it will stick because there's some kind of magnet in the vaccine that misinformation about vaccinations began in the middle of June. Fatalities follow case numbers by about two weeks. And by early July, we saw the fatality rate turn and begin to go up, and then it exceeded where it had been before the vaccinations were available. And, and I challenge the CDC for saying you don't need a vaccine, no, a mask notice. I'm wearing no mask, but I wore one when I walked in, and I'm going to wear one when I walk out, and I'm certainly going to wear one on the subway. Right, so the folks who have vaccinated should wear the mask, and don't. And, and, and Dr. Sachs says, once the vaccines arrive, continued use of precautionary measures are still important. But here is two weeks ago. This is two weeks ago, the head of the Food and Drug Administration. Why do you think misinformation is now the leading cause of death in the U.S.? As you correctly said, heart disease, cancer, COVID, uh, much of this common chronic disease that we know a lot about how to treat. And of course, with COVID, the situation is we know that if you're vaccinated and up to date with your vaccinations, um, you have a 90% reduction in the risk of death. 
And then if you are unlucky enough to get infected or unfortunate enough, another 90% reduction of death with the antivirals, which are now available. So almost no one in this country should be dying from COVID if we were up to date on our vaccinations and got appropriate antiviral treatment. What has concerned me for a long time before the pandemic is that we're seeing this reduction in life expectancy from common diseases like heart disease. I'm a cardiologist by training. We know so much about what to do to prevent um, bad outcomes from heart disease. Um, but somehow the messages, the, the reliable, truthful messages are not getting across and it's being washed out by a lot of misinformation which is leading people to make bad choices that are unfortunate for their health. So the reliance on misinformation is causing people to make bad choices which have a consequence on their health. 90% reduction in fatalities if you're fully vaccinated, another 90 if you get it, uh, another 90 reduction if you get it and take the antivirals. So let's look at the contrast United States and Korea. Through the first year, one out of 8,000, uh, I'm sorry, through the second year, one out of every 8,000 in the United States, one out of every 389 of population, 20 times that of Korea. And where are we now? One year in, it was one out of every 809. Two years in, one out of every 309. <clears throat> Today, I'm sorry, early June, one out of every 330. Today, one out of every 330 still. We're past our adjournment time. I'm happy to hang back and chat, but here's what I'd like us to take away. We know what works and doesn't work in a public health emergency. We need to do what we know works. We need to not do what we know doesn't work. There's a, an American leadership guru called Marshall Goldsmith. And Mr. Goldsmith famously said this, our challenge is not to understand the practice of crisis management, but rather it's to practice our understanding of crisis management. And there are political obstacles to practicing our understanding. There are cultural obstacles to practicing our understanding. But again, we're looking at the biggest crisis we can and we can see the patterns writ large, but the same patterns apply in smaller circumstances. The same patterns apply in much smaller crises, in much smaller public health emergencies, in much smaller instances where ethics is on the line. I study misinformation among other things and misinformation as a form of intentional dishonesty is an ethics issue, but beyond ethics, as we see here, it has profound consequences in human life, in human health, in public safety, in civic order. And part of my mission out in the world is to sound the alarm that, yes, there are all kinds of variables that we can also look at to get a more nuanced and sophisticated understanding. But two principles matter. First, we need to care about the people who are likely to be affected. And second, we need to take risks seriously. And we need to do what is necessary to mitigate those risks. And that is part of the intersection of ethics and crisis. And I call on leaders to take those two principles seriously. And I invite you wherever you are in your leadership journey to take those risks and principles seriously. And as I advise my graduate students in this very room, that we have the capacity to do great good, given our knowledge, our gifts, our work, our understanding of the world, but we also have the capacity to do great harm. And I hope that we are conscious of how the way we make choices and the way we execute those choices and the way we share what we know with the rest of the world has consequences in either great good or in great harm. 
thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to hang back and have a discussion, even a contentious discussion. But, but I welcome the conversation. Thank you for being here today. So, Are you dealing just in the federal level, or would you be discussing New York State and the nursing home disaster? I will make reference to the nursing home disaster in New York State, but I, I won't be comparing nursing homes in different states. What I will be comparing is different states who had different mask mandates. And interestingly, in one state, the state of Kansas, left masks to individual counties. And there are 120 counties in Kansas. 20 of them had mask mandates, and 100 of them did not. And by October of 2020, we saw that the fatality rate in the non-mask counties was double the fatality rate in the mask counties. I also look at a single hospital network in Tennessee. And the hospitals in areas where the patients come from communities without mask mandates was six times higher than the hospital rate for COVID in hospitals where the patient population were from mask mandated areas. So we can see in county compared to county, in catchment area for hospitals compared to catchment areas for hospitals. We also saw, I can contrast two different states. North Dakota and Vermont have similar populations, similar mix of rural to suburban to urban, because not a lot of urban in either state. Complete absence of masks, distancing, or shutdowns in North Dakota. Full CDC guidelines in Vermont. The fatality rate in North Dakota was 20 times that of Vermont by October of 2020. So we can see in different jurisdictions, different outcomes, and this is pre-vaccinations, simply based on following CDC guidelines right, or not following CDC. Full child's view. Yes, sir. Good for you. Um, you, you noted in the top of your presentation the importance of clearly naming the, the, the simple terms of the crisis that we're facing. If the crisis that we're facing is actually one of misinformation or it's one of uh, a culture of exceptionalism, um, do we have the wrong places? Are we actually not solving the right problem? And uh, when we, you know, plenty of information points made about the role of that's a great question and thank you for that in fact I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you someday even if it's a virtual cup of coffee and, and talk about that both from an anthropological perspective and from an ethical perspective uh, at the beginning of the pandemic we had a public health emergency and that public health emergency was made a, made visible to the senior leadership of the government, not just the president, but the cabinet, including Secretary of Health and Human Services, and all of the agencies underneath that, including uh, other elements of the United States government that had some role in dealing with this, including the US military, which, by the way, took the public health emergency really seriously and immediately imposed masking restrictions on soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines and, and early in, in February and March of 2020, I was doing Zoom workshops with the Air Force and Zoom workshops with the Marine Corps, talking to them about how to understand the civilian pushback you're likely to get because the civilians aren't being asked to wear masks and your Marines or your sailors or your airmen or your, your soldiers are likely asked, why should we do that? And, and the answer is the very nature of the work that you do requires you to be in close quarters and requires you to be in circumstances where you can't really control the environment. And I give the military credit, they took that really, really seriously. And I note that even when their commander in chief was saying, don't take masks seriously, you don't need masks, they did it anyway. So I, I, I give the military credit for following public health guidelines. I believe that the problem of misinformation goes way beyond COVID. 
that the problem of misinformation is not one that began five years ago, but it's one that intensified five years ago. But it's a problem that has been a part of the American experiment throughout our history. The difference is now the forms of transmitting misinformation are much easier to access, but the curators of a common culture are no longer here. Back at a time when there were three television networks that basically said the same thing, the entire population that paid attention to television got the same news and the differences were marginal. Today, people choose their news source and get dramatically different news sources, but when that news is amplified, the algorithms of social media give you more of what you've already responded positively to. So the news you get will be dramatically different from this gentleman's news or this person's news or this person's news or my news, and we no longer have access to a common reality. I think as a matter of social, I won't say anthropology, that's your field, but as a matter of social cohesion and social fragmentation, I think that is one of the drivers that made this particular form of misinformation so difficult to manage is because we haven't gotten good at finding a way to counter the narrow casting that gives people completely contrary realities. Is that a fair response? Yeah, thank you. Yes, in the back and then here. Mm -hmm. And yet the government is still, you know, in varying degrees pulling back, you know, mass mandating, social distancing, putting it towards the state governments, which we did, state governments put it towards individual businesses that you happen to be working for at the time. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, how we take those same principles of reacting to a crisis that's currently going on and One of the things I've learned after 42 years of working in crises, it's really hard in the middle of the current crisis to prepare adequately for the next crisis because you haven't really had the full accounting of what happened, what we did well, what we did poorly, what we should, should have done differently. But I will note that there's something really different in the ways that this was distributed to the states because we had states, and I think of Florida, I think of Texas, I think of Tennessee, I think of North Dakota, that forbade mask mandates. And the state of Florida forbade municipalities from requiring masks, forbade school districts and schools from requiring masks. And in my ethics courses in this room, I talk about how do you make choices when duties conflict. When your duty to follow the law conflicts with your ethical obligation, conflicts with your moral obligations, and those are three different categories. And I point to the school districts in Florida, and the school districts in Texas, and the school districts in Tennessee, and the school districts in North Dakota, who said, we are prepared to face the penalty. We are prepared to face the consequence because we have a duty to protect our children, our staff, their families. And what I find morally repugnant, as well as from a public policy point of view, just in, inappropriate, is political leaders who forbid public safety measures. So it's not that they left it to individual jurisdictions they directed individual jurisdictions that you may not use public health measures. And that, to me, is a peculiarly American problem because our system of federalism gives a lot of authority to states, but those states can exercise that authority to the municipal level. It says, no, you can't do that. I honor the municipalities and the school districts who said, we know it's against the law, but we're prepared to pay the penalty because we have a higher obligation that is to protect our students, staff, and their families. Other questions? Yes, sir.
everywhere. Yeah. The U.S. is exceptionally ready. Yeah. Put it that way. And I think the question was the coordination of the national perspective. There's no federal. You said the national coordination disappears. It's still not there, which I understand why that's not. But even though, I guess, for legal reasons, they they don't have a mechanism to forbid right. laws that forbid. And and to be clear. Uh, when the, the, the National Directorate of Biodefense was established in the Pentagon, I'm sorry, in the National Security Council, wasn't it? It was in the White House. In, in the National Security Council, its mandate was to coordinate all of the instruments of policy at the federal and state levels. It doesn't have compliance authority. It has coordination authority. But again, thought experiment. What if the senior executive leadership at the federal level had followed CDC guidelines, then there would be no political incentive for the governors of Florida or Texas or Tennessee or North Dakota to try to be even more extreme than the federal commander in chief. So they were trying to appeal to that same electorate that supported the president. And in, in the case of the governor of Florida, he affirmatively seems to have desires to run for president in 24. So he was trying to build his base at the national level by getting a reputation for being more Trumpy than Trump. And he continues to behave that way, whether on guns or on other things. Thank you. Um, I actually was a journalist in Thailand and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And I covered both Hurricane Katrina on site in the media. Oh. So was I. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I covered the cell. Uh, you covered? Cell oh, you did? Yeah. Did I get it? Did I get it okay? <laughs> well, yeah. Actually, with that um, disaster, there was a lot of government miscommunication between the different divisions. That, that's what my sponsor told me. Which, in turn, gave me wrong numbers. Right. So I was actually reporting wrong numbers right. to different sources. Mm -hmm. And then I also was reporting for BBC. Mm -hmm. And um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I personally um, had, I, I noticed your, your presentation today was very like, focused on Trump. But then I'm also wondering what your stance on like, Cuomo's response was. Because he's the one coming out with the book, with, right. came out with the book on right. leadership in crisis. But, um, so, for example, I I had actually had a route to communicate um, to Governor Cuomo through his daughter about getting the mask. By the way, his daughter is my daughter's best friend. Oh, really? Who used to sleep over at my house all the time. Okay. So I was getting the same kind of stuff in my ear that you were probably getting in your ear. <laughs> I had a connection to get masks from South Korea. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. over dinner. And then he, the next day I actually saw in the news, which was very downplayed by the way, that the governor of Maryland's wife, who's South Korean, got access to the masks from South Korea, from one of the distributors that I had uh, mm -hmm. contact with. But Governor Cuomo had downplayed that whole situation. He reported it during his daily briefing. And then... Yeah, I'm sorry, he reported what during his daily briefings? Uh, his his like, COVID coverage. Right. You're talking Chris Cuomo. Both of them. Okay. It right. actually quite upset me because I was actually sick at the same time. Right. And um, I'm, I saw how he handled, you're talking about like how the states were handling it individually versus the federal, but then, um, actually, this is like getting me all upset. Sorry. But um, I was really, really sick and I didn't even have access to the medication that Chris Cuomo had presented on. Right. Because when I found out from other medical professionals in New Jersey, Governor Cuomo had bought out the New Jersey supply oh, wow. for New York. Right. And, um, and then so with an inside route to Governor Cuomo,
phone mom to try to get access to the mask. Later, I found out that he had actually purchased a mask from the like, through the Chinese distributor, right. which, you know, Governor Cuomo told his daughter, apparently, like, he wants to support local businesses to produce, which I understand. Yeah. But then the fact that he went through China to get, like, he didn't really follow through on his claims. Like, I just... One after another, I kept seeing all these red flags in his leadership. Right. So I was wondering, your book, from the presentation today, looks very Trump-focused. But rather than just Republicans, there are issues on the Democrats. Oh, yeah. Side. No question. So, so I was wondering... So, so here's, here's my, my assessment of, of Governor Cuomo's COVID response. No, I, I have no idea because it wasn't presented. Yeah, but, I'll, but no, I'll share it with you. Okay. Uh, in the early phases of COVID, I think he was an, a very effective advocate for the people of New York, especially when New Yorkers were dying in record numbers. And, and he was trying very hard to get the federal government to free up resources and discovered that they had been buying up all of the ventilators and others and not sharing it with the states. Uh, I give him a lot of credit. I actually published in April of 2020 a comparison of here's the governor every day talking to New Yorkers and through New Yorkers, the American public. Here's what's happening with COVID. Here's how many cases we have. Here's how many hospitalizations we have. Here's how many fatalities we have. The president was not doing that at the time. The governor was. I believe something happened in the summer. I don't know what it is. I have not talked to... I, I respect the relationship of my daughter to his daughter. I don't want to interfere in that relationship. Uh, I believe the governor became deeply politicized in the summer in ways that were not apparent in the spring. He may have also been deeply politicized in the spring, but he was the only nationally known public official, in my view, that was actually leveling with the American people in a consistent daily way. And so I give him credit for that. I also, true story, happened to dislike him intensely, and I know him at the dad-to-dad -dad at the soccer field level. So, so I, I have a respect for his work as governor. I have deep concerns just about his temperament, and I note that he left office in a cloud, and I have deep concerns about those things as well. Uh, having said that, uh, I was glad in April of 2020, that there was someone who happened to be the governor of the state I live in, uh, out there leveling with the American public, at least about the scope of the pandemic in New York, which was the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. With Cuomo's answer, I have very mixed feelings. Yeah, he was a leader, he got everyone yeah. to wear masks, but he writes a book in the summer of 2020. That, that's when he gets political. Yeah. 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 Also, you have the whole nursing home scandal. Also, another thing that we found out that Cuomo was doing, he had his vaccine czar calling up the, the county executives, and in the same conversation that he was, that the vaccine czar was saying, you know, how many vaccines do you need? Where do you want them to be distributed? He was also saying, do you support Cuomo with respect to the sexual? Yeah. And then when this came out um, to the public, the, the defense, they didn't even deny that those things were discussed in the same conversation. The, um, what, the way Cuomo defended himself is, well, the, what the county executive said with respect to supporting him with the sexual harassment scale had nothing to do with helping the county down with right. the vaccine. Yeah, I agree with you. I have completely mixed feelings. I've just shared those mixed feelings, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I have to say, I'm not particularly surprised that politicians are callow and political. H having said that, I think you're right. His doing a victory lap prematurely was at least deeply unpalatable and offensive. I still give him credit for being the only person in April who seemed to be telling it straight about just how bad things were in New York because the other guy was saying just how good it's going. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? They were actually like in New Jersey. Yeah. My father yeah. Like yeah. So, like, you're talking about honesty and the truth. Like, I was really hearing that people were reporting low numbers in Korea. 
But Governor Cuomo was reporting insanely wrong numbers, especially with the nursing home deaths. Mm -hmm. so I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm also equally troubled that he, he underplayed in material ways the severity of this in nursing homes. Shame on him. Uh, shame on him for trying to benefit politically from his role in the crisis. Uh, it, it, it's really interesting to me. At the time, I watched his interaction with his brother and, and just putting on my ethics professor hat asked, is that good for CNN? It, you know, how can CNN think that's a good thing? And turns out they discovered it was a bad thing. But, uh, but I, again, I, as a matter of temperament, I, I don't think he's got the right temperament. I, as a dad to dad on the soccer field, I tried to stay away. <laughs> uh, but I give him credit for at least being honest to the degree he was. Because there was nobody else sharing candid information about how bad it was in New York. And as a New Yorker, that to me was a big deal. That, that it, but for him, we wouldn't have known why we hear all the sirens all the time and why there are refrigerator trucks in front of Elmhurst, Elmhurst Hospital. Sir, you. People joke that politicians are probably as tough as you can expect. Yeah, right. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm shocked that a politician would behave politically. but. That's right. But, but also, there was, there was a tendency, and again, I don't mean to make it all about Trump, but he was a guy in charge. There was a tendency when he disagreed with someone at the CDC to denounce them, and then suddenly they needed a security detail because there were death threats, and, and Fauci couldn't go anywhere without a full Secret Service detail surrounding him because he was the subject of just horrible death threats, and as was his wife. And, and so it's one thing to disagree with the with with uh, career civil servants who know what they're talking about. It's another thing to put a crosshairs on their forehead and send them out into the world where his followers take matters into their own hands. Just look at last night's television events to, to see how some of that plays out. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's the way it is. <laughs> I don't know that I have the recipe for that. I, I do know that, so if, if, you, if you read carefully George Orwell's Politics in the English Language, and I advise my graduate students in communication to read Politics in the English Language, George Orwell said, political speech is usually insincere speech where the politician doesn't mean what he or she is saying. But the followers tend to believe that politician. And as they believe that politician who doesn't believe what he or she is saying, their critical thinking diminishes and they're more susceptible to more political speech that is also misleading. And that creates a cycle where the citizenry becomes less and less capable of critical thinking and ends up where words have the opposite meaning. So what you call the truth is really a lie. What you call peace is really war. So the Ministry of Peace manages war. The Ministry of Plenty rations food. So politics in the English language was essentially the primer for what became 1984, two years earlier. I think part of the challenge in the United States is that simultaneous with the fragmentation of media and, and the technologies that allow us to get only curated content that affirms our own biases, we also have stopped teaching civic education in schools, that, that we have stopped having children participate in civic events, we have stopped teaching critical thinking skills even at the level of university. Uh, and I think there's a social pendulum that needs to swing back. I don't think there's a single common solution, but 
an non-critical thinking electorate, a non-critical thinking society, is one that revels in the misinformation. And, and it, oh, it, it, first of all, it gives us meaning that we're part of something bigger than ourselves, and that's what all of us seem to want. But now the something that's bigger than ourselves is a much narrower version. And it's completely different from the person sitting next to us and their meaning of something bigger than ourselves. Right, right. 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 There's, there's one other thing that I, I think there's two other factors that are, that are playing into this. Now, I had the good fortune as a teenager of working as a page on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives while President Nixon was being impeached. So I had the good fortune of sitting in the back of the hearing room and watch Barbara Jordan say, no president is above the law. And people rallied and applauded. And when Watergate happened, it was Republican leaders in the House who walked over to the White House and said, Mr. President, you've lost your political su support here on the Hill. If you want to avoid conviction in the Senate, you got to resign. And he resigned. That is unimaginable today. So what we have in, in, in an earlier book I wrote, I trace this back to the uh, speakership of Newt Gingrich. That when Newt Gingrich became speaker, we saw this extreme villainization of people of the other party, and in particular of President Clinton. And he set himself up to be essentially the co-president. And he refused compromise. And we can trace this wave, it's not the only wave, but this particular wave for the last 30 years of political incivility and political polarization to have started then. It's far worse now. But at the same time, we saw something else. In 1995, Disney bought ABC. And Westinghouse bought CBS and later sold it to Viacom. General Electric had already bought NBC. Before they were owned by media conglomerates, the news divisions at CBS, NBC, and ABC were loss leaders. They were not expected to make a profit. They didn't have a budget. And they never looked at ratings. And you listen to the old timers. Cronkite's producer was a guy named Don Hewitt. And Hewitt also invented the 60 Minutes broadcast. And he wrote a book about his time at CBS. And he said in his book called Tell Me a Story, 50 Years and 60 Minutes in Television, he said, when I was producing the Walter Cronkite show, when I was producing 60 Minutes, my bosses at CBS never said, you got to make us money. They said, you got to make us proud. And I was never expected to make a profit, and I didn't have a budget. And if I needed to open a bureau in Johannesburg, I didn't have to ask permission. I opened a bureau in Johannesburg. If I needed to fly someone around the world to pick up film and bring it back to CBS on the same day, I could charter that airplane and make it happen. But after the corporations that are media conglomerates got the news, the news became part of the continuum of entertainment. And suddenly, ratings drove everything. And so we went from a public service mentality. This is Don Hewitt talking. We went from a public service mentality to a public spectacle mentality, because that's what keeps the eyeballs on the screen. That coincided with political incivility. And that political incivility drove coverage. And so when we get to the Tea Party, when we get to then when Mexico sends its people, it's not sending their best people. They're sending rapists. That was catnip, or even more crack cocaine, to the television news producers who just kept going with the spectacle rather than with the public service. So you, 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 I, I call it a braid. We have three simultaneous trends. We have a decline in critical thinking skills and lack of civic understanding. We have severe political polarization at the very time when the news media 
is migrating from public service to spectacle. You put all of those together, you get a kind of perfect storm of essentially a dysfunctional society. And then COVID happens, and it is politicized. And all of those trends play into the, the thing at an even greater level. So I think when, when you think about what are the solutions, you can't solve one until you solve the others. Right. And if, if I could just comment on the phrase scripted television, that's a great phrase. Yeah. Um, and also just younger yeah. people in the room. Um, kind of going back to your original slide of, of the uh, Venn diagram you have. Trust. You haven't known the Walter right. Cronkite experience, right? Well, I've never lived in a media or entertainment experience that's not exactly what we have today. And I feel like that's part of the reason why I'm here and I'm talking to you about this stuff. And I feel like there is a lot of there's almost a lack of trust to begin with from someone that's my age in right. whatever the news is telling us because we grew up knowing that it's not necessarily the correct or the, you know, the only information that they're telling us. There are so many things going on in the background. Thank you. There, there's also one other really interesting trend that, that gets to the pre-1995 thing. There's, there's a New York Times television critic wh whose last name I'm probably going to mispronounce, but it's Pani, Pani Wazak. Uh, and he, he wrote a book about the American news media fragmentation, the, the things I talked about. Uh, and he says, until the 1950s, the United States was essentially a nation of regions. And what you ate in one part of the country was different from what you ate in another. The accent you spoke was different in one part of the country than another. The news you absorbed was different in one part of the country than the other, but it was insular. In the 1950s, a bunch of things began to happen. The national highway system suddenly made it easy to travel around the country. Also, commercial aviation became accessible to ordinary folks and increasingly affordable. And that's the time when fast food chains began to be marketed. That's when McDonald's began and by the 1960s. That's when no matter where you went in the country, you go into a McDonald's, it tastes and it feels exactly the same. You have the exact same experience anywhere in the country. Television news began to unify the country. National brands began to unify the country. So what you find in a supermarket in Georgia is the same as you find in a supermarket in Minneapolis, which is the same as you find in a supermarket in Arizona. And that wasn't the case before the 1950s. That's the case now. He said this, this national vantage point, you got the same news no matter where you lived. You ate the same food no matter where you lived. You had access to the same entertainment no matter where you lived. And that, net, that created social cohesion as more than just regions. But what has happened now is the pendulum is swung in the other direction, and you have fragmentation. So as before, it was geographically fragmented. And then it was unified, or at least homogenized. And now it's fragmented by ideology, by entertainment choice. If, if you watch one streaming service, because this generation doesn't watch a lot of network, they watch streaming. Uh, at least I'm thinking about my daughters who are 27 and 31, that, that if, you, if you think of where people get their entertainment, it's fragmented. Now maybe a lot of people are going to go watch Top Gun, but most are going to just watch what's streaming because we've gotten out of the habit of being in theaters. Um, but the entertainment is fragmented. The political reality is fragmented. Our view of the pandemic is fragmented. I didn't say this in the large group, but I'll, but I'll say it here. If you're anti-vax, you're more likely to be anti-mask. You're more likely to believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president of the United States. And there's no logical reason those three things should go together. But that's what it means to be part of a team. I teach it. More like you, like Fox. And, and, and yes. <laughs> and and I, I'm on the faculty of the Stern School of Business at NYU. And one of my faculty colleagues a guy named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. 
He's an economist of morality and a brilliant guy. And in several of his books, he says that the strongest human impulse is to be a member of a team. And, and we will do anything it takes to pr protect and promote our team when it is under attack. And I think that's part of what explains why someone who's anti-Basque is also anti-Vax, also believes that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president of the United States, and also consumes the same kind of news, that what they have in common is they're part of the same team. They don't understand what team they're be on. Because they believe their own rhetoric, by the way, so, does, so do members of the opposite team. And I'm on the opposite team, and I believe my own rhetoric. And, and I recognize that we both suffer from the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, and that is we're unaware that we're not as good at what we think we're good at as we are. But also media, I think. Thank you. Like Say hi to Chuck. It was a bigger team. No, but it's also like, can you imagine FDR or even Kennedy today? Yeah. FDR would never get away with what he pulled off with how he used to walk and get along. Right, yeah. Kennedy with all his health issues. Yeah, and, and by the way, Kennedy lied about his health I mean, issues. Yeah. At the debate, get away with it today. at the debate, the one that made him president, mm -hmm. he was wearing a back brace and he was in great pain because of Addison's disease, but they didn't disclose that he had Addison's he disease. Yeah, even better. They knew it. They knew how FDR got around. Right. And it was not me. And right. I treated my people because they were protecting the right. country, I think. I mean, that's my only logic. I think. The, the CBS News anchor, Bernard Kalb, my generation, not yours, uh, wrote a book right after uh, the Monica Lewinsky scandal called One Scandalous Story. And it wasn't about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. It was about the media's coverage mm. of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. But he told a story that when he was a young reporter, he was covering President Kennedy. President Kennedy made a trip to the United Nations General Assembly. And he was staying at the Carlisle Hotel. And Bobby Short played the piano in the bar of the Cafe Carlisle. And Bernard Kalb, as part of the press pool, is also staying at the Carlisle Hotel. And when the president goes upstairs, Everyone in the press pool goes to the bar, and it's a really good bar. If you haven't been at the bar at the Carlisle Hotel, you ought to go. I spent my wedding night in the Carlisle Hotel. I know the bar very well. Uh, but Bernard Calb at one point had a question about his checkout time. So he went to the lobby to ask the desk clerk a question. And as he's in the lobby, the doors open, and he recognizes the people coming in as Secret Service agents. And they tackle him. And they put him on the ground, and they put their arms on his head, and they hold his face to the ground. And then he looks through this Secret Service agent's arm, and a pair of feet in high heels walk by and get into an elevator. And the elevator doors close, and the Secret Service guy picks him up and dusts him off and says, sorry, Bernie, had to do that. And he says that he went back to the bar, and it never occurred to him to tell any of the other journalists at the bar that President Kennedy had a woman in his room right now, that he said it just wouldn't be done in 1963. But in, in 1988, <laughs> we're going to reveal every single flaw of every single politician. So that's another way that journalism changed. Oh, we got to go. But this has been so wonderful.